Welcome everyone. We are excited to have you join us today for Show Shared in the Kitchen Six Minute Dishes with Karen Nochimowski. I'm Jessica Jablon, California Regional Director at Show Share It. For those of you who don't know about Show Share It, we help women and families facing breast and ovarian cancer, as well as those who are at elevated genetic risk through free confidential and personalized support and resources. We also provide health education throughout the country. One of our goals is to make sure that we are offering healthy living and cancer prevention information to you and giving you what support you need. In addition to our virtual services that can be found on our website or by emailing us, you can also access prior webinars on a range of cancer-related topics, as well as access our calendar of upcoming virtual programs through our website. Today's webinar is being recorded. Participants' faces and names will not be in the recording as long as you remain muted. It, it will be posted on Charcheret's website along with a transcript in the next week or so. If you would like to remain private, you can turn off your video and rename yourself, or you can call into the webinar. And instructions are in the chat box now for both options. You may have noticed all participants were muted upon entry. Please keep yourself on mute throughout the call. If you have questions for Karen, put them in the chat box either publicly or click on Share Share It in the chat box to submit a private question and I will ask them throughout the program. We'll, we will send out a follow-up email with tips and recommendations from today's webinar with the recording in the next week or so. We are very excited to continue our partnership, uh, uh, to continue our Share Share It in the Kitchen series, an initiative in partnership with Cedar sinai here in Los Angeles to empower those of us at risk for breast and ovarian cancer to make healthier diet choices. We've had really wonderful guests on this healthier cooking series, and we invite you to check out our prior Share Shared in the Kitchen webinars on our website at the link in the chat. Now you should have received the recipes for today's program in advance, and my colleague is going to put the link in the chat box so you can download it and print it, or you can see it on your screen. We wanna thank our incredible sponsors, Cedar sinai the Cooperative Agreement DP19-1906 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Merck. It is because of their generous support that we have been able to continue to provide our series of incredible webinars. We also want to thank our community partner, Women to Women, for being here with us today. As part of Share Share It in the Kitchen, we offer free nutrition counseling with dietitians Tamar Rothenberg on a rolling basis and Rachel Beller, whose next masterclass is starting in May. This is a free opportunity for people who are high in high people who are high risk in treatment or thr thrivership. We have spots open now for our next cohort. This is breaking news as the wait list just has been lifted, and we encourage you to apply today if you're interested. This is thanks to our generous sponsors, Cedar sinai and the Max and Aaron Barron, Ben and Sarah Barron, and Milton Barron Endowment Fund of the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles. The link to apply is in the chat. I also want to share with you one of my favorite programs at Share Share It, our Busy Boxes. We send busy boxes to families with young children to help parents guide their children through the cancer or prophylactic surgery journey. Each busy box includes resource materials to educate parents about the impact of breast and ovarian cancer or prophylactic surgery on children. They also feature a starter kit of games and activities to occupy your children while you're at the doctor or resting after surgery or treatment. I also want to share that we do organize Amazon wish lists and toy drives for our busy boxes. And if you're interested in planning uh, one of these and learning more, uh, please fill out the evaluation at the end of the program and let us know or email us at info at charshareit.org. As a special treat for a limited number of recipients, today's chef Karen generously helped us give 50 cookbooks to new busy box recipients. Our community is very appreciative of this busy box bonus. Thank you so much for that, Karen. Now, before we get cooking, I want to introduce Tamar, who will be sharing her story with us. All right, everyone can hear me, yeah? Good. Oh, here, oh, no, no, I'm, on, I'm on the big screen now. Hi, um, my name is Tamar. I uh, was asked to talk to you guys because uh, I've used to share its resources, including the Busy Box. So a little bit about me, I am a breast cancer survivor, which at 43 years old feels really weird to say. But it's true. Um, I uh, was diagnosed last year from an annual screening mammogram. Um, the tumor is only three to four millimeters, so super duper small. And I went down the rabbit hole, and and I, from what I can under, from what I can see, two millimeters is the smallest they can see on the mammogram. So they caught it super super early. Um, 
hormone positive, HER2 negative, stage 1A. Um, so I had um, surgery. In, well, they found it at the end of, you know, the, my mom had breast cancer, I should say, a few years ago. So when I was 40, I went for my first screening and I got called back for a biopsy and it was a fibroadenoma because I have dense breasts and it's not a big, you know, okay. So then I was 41 and I got my screening and it was fine. And then I was 42 and I got my screening and they had me come back and then they had me come back for a biopsy and they biopsy both sides. One side was a fibroadenoma. The other side was the tumor. So it was just a little shocking because I wasn't expecting something like that, but I was able to have surgery um, did the uh, lumpectomy and the sentinel node biopsy. They took the, the sentinel node and the three attached lymph nodes. Um, did have to do some physical therapy because of that. So uh, I would definitely, um, I would definitely you know, recommend if you're having, if you did have surgery and you had any issues in the, like the arm being tight or whatever, hurting the muscle being weird, and definitely talk with your doctor about that. Um, but yeah, I, I, and then I, oh, and then I did radiation um, for, it was like the month of July, like 16 rounds. So no chemo, the genetics were negative. I'm on tamoxifen for five years, which my side effects have been pretty minimal. Um, it's, you know, it's not fun, but it could have been way worse. I was very, very lucky. Um, I'm married, I'm a mom, my kids are five and eight. So when I was diagnosed, they were four and seven, and the four-year-old really didn't understand what was going on. The, the, the older one, a little bit, I think she understood, but it was great. I contacted Treasure right in the beginning of my diagnosis, and they sent me some great materials, and one of the things they sent was the busy box, which had some really great, great uh, material on how to talk to your kids about it, which I was really worried about because like they're, they're young and they don't really understand. And so that really helped me. And then they like the, they like the toys, which, um, which I know sure share it uh, sort of asked a little bit about the kids' interests. So that was nice to be able to, um, you know, have some toys that I knew that and, and some in and, and games and stuff that I knew that they would like. That was really helpful during uh, the recovery. And then, you know, you get tired from radiation. So like, go play with your games. <laughs> but um, I I felt like whenever I would get a, a delivery, there would be like a, like something would show up at my house that was from Share Share It. And I opened it up and it was always like the perfect thing, like for, for like that point in my journey. So it was uh, like, it was, I don't know. I don't know how they, how they know when to send everything, <laughs> but it was good. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, I wanted to, uh, give back. So I became, I was asked to become a peer supporter, uh, for sure, share it. And I agreed. And so I haven't done it yet, but I, but I got the material, so I'm going to read it. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I just want to tell you guys all about, yeah, this, just my journey and then also uh, about the busy box because it was it was very helpful for my family especially having the younger kids um and I mean I don't know I don't know if anybody has questions I, I'm, I'm happy to talk any uh with about that if anybody has questions thank you thanks so much Tamar um you know we really appreciate you being here and being so open and sharing your story with us you know, today, and I'm sure if anyone wanted to um, comment, they can put it into the chat um, and um, and find out more about our busy boxes and um, information from um, Amy, um, who is also um, on here. You can see her at Sharshara dash Amy Sachs. Um, now, I'm so excited to welcome Karen Nochamowski. Karen is the creator of the popular food blog, Mama Chef, and writes a monthly food column for the Daily Herald. She has appeared on Live with Kelly and Ryan and WGN Radio. She lives in Chicago, Illinois. Her debut cookbook, Six Minute Dinners and More, 100 Super Simple Dishes with Six Minutes of Prep and Six Ingredients or Less, came out recently, and it's all about flavor and ease. For those who can't always find the time to cook these meals, and there are over 100 recipes to choose from, will save you both time and money without compromising on flavor. Please stay tuned to the end of our webinar and fill out our survey for a chance to win a one copy of Karen's cookbook. 
And welcome to Share Shared in the Kitchen, Karen. We're so happy that you are here to share some of your super simple recipes with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to be part of this webinar. Um, I kind of wanted to just share a little bit about my story of how I got started, because um, it really is more than a cookbook and more than um, a cooking blog. And then we will get to these awesome recipes um, that you guys will not believe how great they are and how easy they are to make. Um, so a little bit of background. I um, have pretty much been cooking since I am not trained at all. Um, I've taken a couple cooking classes along the way, but I've been cooking pretty much since college. Um, I lived abroad in Israel and I used to go to the shuk and pick up ingredients and cook um, for my roommates. And so I really enjoyed cooking. Um, and then motherhood happened and I didn't have the time to really make these like intricate meals. Um, and so I started figuring out ways just to cook really easy, to have meals that my kids liked, my husband liked, and also things that would take five, 10 minutes to get in the oven um, or on the stove, and then I could just kind of walk away. And that's really how I started cooking. And I think my friends kind of would come over. We'd have like a big Shabbat dinner. And I would joke that I, you know, we have 25 people and I started cooking at three o'clock and everyone's like, how do you do it? Share your recipes. Um, so I started sharing my recipes for about I don't know, I'd say about two years. And one day a friend had asked for a recipe that I had shared probably like 40 times. Um, it was a honey curry chicken, which is in the cookbook. It's actually on the blog. And I was like, you know what, let me just start a website um, just to put all of the recipes on there. I probably had like 15 recipes at the time um, so that people can just go there. Like I was honestly sick of looking at my sent mails and trying to find the recipes to send them. Um, so I started the Mama Chef blog. I just thought that was a cute name and it really described me at the time. I had three, I have three boys. My kids were, you know, much younger than in 2018. I was running around kind of the, um, my logo, which um, we had replaced because I realized that I just like stole it from something online, was just a mom holding a kid with a dog at the feet, trying, you know, at the stove, trying to get dinner on the table. Um, and the blog grew, like blew up within, I'd say a month or two, I started getting a thousand followers, 2000 followers. I started a Facebook page. Um, fast forward six months, I had around 25,000 followers and like amazing comments. I was adding new recipes probably every week or two. Um, I had someone revamp the blog, um, someone who knew what they were doing because I didn't. And um, it just took off. I probably had around 90,000 followers within the first year. I was writing for, I was contributing my recipes, um, Costco Connection, Huffington Post, Chicago Tribune, WGN. Um, working Mother's Magazine, like I was in these huge publications. Um, and I would have thought that I would have felt completely fulfilled. Like, how did I get to this spot in a year and a half where I had all these followers and I was on, um, I was being featured in all these magazines and I didn't. Like, I felt like there was something missing. Um, and I just had this idea. It was kind of the middle of the night, 2 a.m. You know, you wake up, your, your mind's racing and I was like, how, maybe I can feed people in need um, through my recipes. We had volunteered at local organizations that were helping feed people in the Jewish community. Um, and so I kind of, I woke up and I was like, I want to do this. And I spent about two months putting together a business plan. Um, I met with a synagogue um, in West Rogers Park, and they happened to be down the street from the ARC, which is a Jewish social service um, organization, and they, there's a really big need, um, unfortunately, in Chicago. Um, so we opened up the of people in, you know, facing food insecurity, and we opened up the soup kitchen um, at Congregation Kins, which is in West, West Rogers Park, about three months after I met with the president and the rabbi, we had the soup kitchen open. It's a kosher soup kitchen. Um, we've been open for over three years. We've served over 20,000, 25,000 um, homemade kosher meals. They're really nice meals and they're really healthy meals because we only do this once a week. Um, we can do fruit salad and salad and meat and rice. So they're really nice, um, nice meals that we provide. All the recipes um, are from either my blog or my cookbook. Um, fast forward during COVID, um, you know, I saw, as most of us did, the lines outside of the food pantries. Um, you know, they were just, food insecurity was increasing. And I just had this idea of 
doing an outdoor food pantry, kind of like the libraries that you guys see, um, where you take a book, leave a book. Um, I had the idea of doing that with food, non-perishable food. And about three months after um, I had this idea, I actually put my oldest son, um, who had just turned 16 at the time, so he was driving, I kind of put him in charge of this project. Um, and he worked with a church, uh, the pastor at a church, and we installed our first outdoor food pantry. Um, they're called Mama, it's called the Mama Chef Food Pantry Movement. Um, and we installed our first one in 2021, and I installed um, the fourth one about two months ago. Um, we have two of them at churches, two of them um, in front of churches, in front of synagogues. Um, we provide a lot of food. Um, we don't have people leave food. We just fill it up um, probably every day or every other day. Um, food's being filled and we've provided um, probably the same 15 to 20,000 pounds of non-perishable food. Um, to, to those in need. And actually, um, I'll talk about the cookbook, but what's nice is that part of the proceeds from the cookbook um, are going back to the soup kitchen and to the pantries and to feeding people um, who are suffering or facing food insecurity. Um, but I always had this dream also of writing a cookbook. And I was lucky enough, I think because I had a really nice following. Um, and I think because the comments and the reviews on my recipes um, were just really supportive. Um, you know, people would reach out or say, thank you for making me feel like a hero. Um, and the first time in the kitchen last night for the first time, people who had never cooked. Um, and, and so I was, um, I had three offers from agents. I signed with one of them. Um, shortly after I did get a cookbook deal, I worked about two years on this cookbook, um, six minute dinners and more. Um, Jessica had mentioned it's filled with over 100 um, recipes. They're all made with six ingredients and less and under six minutes of prep time. Um, you'll see, we're going to start in a minute. Um, preparing these wonderful dishes that are from the cookbook. Most of the recipes in the cookbook are not on my blog. Um, I had to come up with new recipes um, that wouldn't really be found anywhere else. So that's what took about two years. A lot of, I had a very, very happy husband, a very, very happy neighbors. There was a lot of taste testing um, during those two years, but it's really, it's been great. Um, I sent it out to uh, Katie Couric, Gloria Stefan. I got really nice um, celebrity um, endorsements who tried some of the recipes, which was great, um, just to kind of have people, um, you know, who have a nice following believing in the cookbook also. So this just came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's available anywhere on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, a lot of the smaller bookstores. Um, and we're going to be making a couple recipes from here. Um, these are recipes that you guys chose. Um, we're, we are going to start with, because it's going to take a little bit longer, um, one of them is going to be a soup recipe. So let me just open up here. Um, first one is the creamy carrot and sweet potato soup. Um, now, when I say six minutes prep, that means you'll basically spend, you know, three to six minutes getting it together and then you can kind of walk away. So it doesn't mean cook time, it just means prep time. Um, so this one we will let cook for about 50 minutes so we'll get started. I hope some of you guys are making it along with me because it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so here we go. I am, um, I'm gonna start back here. I'm a really big fan of buying things that are already pre-chopped. Um, and what I did in my cookbook is I actually made a conscious effort to come up with recipes that would work for um, containers of pre-chopped onions and sweet potatoes, carrots, um, you'll see in the cauliflower rice. And I made sure the amounts pretty much matched what most grocery stores, um, the amounts that are sold in most grocery stores. So for instance, right now, we're gonna be making the creamy carrot and sweet potato soup. So what we're gonna be doing is we're just gonna be taking a pot and we're gonna be heating on here two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Um, I know you guys might have some questions about different types of oil. I cook a lot with olive oil. If I'm cooking at high heat, I'll also cook a lot with avocado oil. Um, you can use coconut oil as well. Um, I would say my favorite oil really to cook with, and I've kind of done a lot of research to see um, the benefits of it as well, is avocado oil. Um, I really do like that. And I feel like it doesn't really have a strong taste. You can really use it in anything. Um, for this one, I'm using olive oil. I like to use that when I'm really sauteing um, vegetables. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat the oil up just for a minute. 
And we're gonna put in here one cup of diced white or yellow onions. These are organic diced white onions from Whole Foods. Um, and it's one cup, it's 10 ounces, which is a tad more than one cup. I use the whole thing. If you wanna leave a little bit out and put them in a Ziploc bag, you can do that. So all we're gonna do is saute these for about three minutes. And you don't wanna have the, you wanna have the heat high enough um, that they're cooking and that you can kind of hear it. You can hear the oil in there, um, but you don't wanna have it too high um, that they'll burn. I don't use a lot of oil in this recipe. Um, in a lot of my recipes, I don't really use that much oil. Um, so you just wanna keep an eye on them. And then you just wanna let them saute for about, I would say about two or three minutes. They don't, and they're not going to be cooked through um, because they're gonna cook through when you're cooking the soup. Um, after that, what you're gonna do is, and I'll show you. Um, okay, it calls for two cups of sweet potatoes. This is the Whole Foods diced sweet potatoes. I buy it like this, it is two cups. Um, a lot of places, a lot of grocery stores, I know Trader Joe's, I know we're in Chicago, so we have Jewel Asco. Um, they sell sweet potatoes cut up. I think even Costco sells sweet potatoes cut up. It's so much easier. Uh, I have to tell you, I think the last time that I peeled and sliced a sweet potato was probably years ago. Um, and so this is actually the perfect amount for this recipe. So what you're gonna do is you're then gonna put in, and you can probably hear, the onions in there. So after that, you're gonna be putting in the sweet potatoes. This is two cups, that's it. And then you're gonna use a 16 ounce bag of carrots. This is the Whole Foods baby carrots. It's a 16 ounce bag. Um, here we have two teaspoons of dried thyme. I love thyme in this recipe. Um, so we're just gonna put this in here. You can use in this recipe fresh thyme or dried thyme. Um, I like to buy um, the packages. I'm sure you guys have seen them. They're the packages of herbs that come in like a see-through plastic container. And I just keep them in my freezer and they stay good for probably at least a year. Um, and then after that, we're gonna be using vegetable broth. So what we have are two 32 ounce boxes of vegetable broth. You're just gonna dump them in here. And that is it. I'm just going to mix it around. You're going to partially cover it. And you're gonna let it cook on, I would say medium, uh, medium, medium low for about 55 minutes. When it is done, everything will be very soft. I like to puree most of my soups. Um, this is up to you. What I would use is, uh, my favorite is an immersion blender. Um, super easy. You wanna make sure you use a pan um, a pot or a pan that's large enough because if you're using one that's not deep enough, the soup will splatter. Um, so you just want to make sure you have a couple inches on top of the soup if you're going to use the immersion blender. If not, you can just use a regular blender. Pour it in the blender, puree it, um, and that's it. It's super, super easy. Um, and the recipe can be found in the cookbook. It's a really healthy, comforting soup. Um, it's it's actually this one. Um, I took about 20 of my most popular recipes from my blog um, and put them in the cookbook. And this is one that is also on the blog just because people have loved it so much. Um, and I've had it on there. I've been making this since my oldest, who's 18, was probably two years old. Um, so I've been making it for a really long time. Um, and that's the soup. And that will be ready. And then when you're done, that's it. You blend it. Um, it will last in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Just put it in a sealed container. 
Um, and it's really a hit. My kids like it. My husband likes it. Um, you can add salt when you're done. You can also use low sodium broth um, if you're watching your sodium intake, and then you can kind of add the salt after. Um, that's what I usually suggest to do if anyone's watching um, their salt intake. That way that, you know, it's not um, too overly salty from the broth. Um, and that's it. That's the first recipe. Um, any questions or are we good to move on to the second one? Oh, it looks like we're good to move on. That's amazing Perfect. how simple that was. Yeah. Okay. So the second recipe, um, this is a salad um, that I created when I was um, coming up with the recipes for the cookbook. Um, I had made something similar, but um, it definitely was not a six under six recipe. So I kind of worked to make it to fit um, the cookbook. And I think that I made, when I created this recipe, I think I might have made it about six to 10 times over the next two weeks. Like my husband said to me, we've had enough of it. Like I just loved it so much and I keep it in the refrigerator. It is so refreshing. It is so healthy. Um, even if you don't love cauliflower, um, I really think you're going to like this. Like it just, just the herbs and the dressing and everything together in this recipe. Um, it's really probably one of my favorite salads and a very, very healthy salad. Um, so it's a cauliflower salad with pomegranate and toasted almonds. Um, so what I will tell you, this is so unbelievably easy. The only part of this um, that I've ever messed up is when you, and I don't know if you guys ever toast um, your nuts, is you have to be very careful when you toast your nuts. Um, I put them in for about a minute max. I keep an eye on them. I would say probably 50% of the time that I've toasted nuts, I've burned them. So I've started actually setting the timer on my phone um, because you get busy doing other things. Um, and so what we're gonna do is the first thing we're gonna do is we're just going to put these in the toaster for one minute. Um, while, we're, while they're toasting, we'll just assemble everything else. Okay, so these are going to toast for about a minute. It might, we'll look at them. You might want to do it for a minute or two, depending upon if your toaster is hot. Um, this is the first time we're using the toaster today. So it might take a minute to warm up and then it might take a minute to toast them. Um, and then what we're going to be doing after this is we're going to be using two cups of fresh riced cauliflower. Um, this is the Whole Foods Organic Rice Cauliflower. Do not use frozen in this recipe. It needs to be fresh rice cauliflower. Um, if you don't have that and you have heads of cauliflower, you can look in the, if you have the cookbook, I give tips um, on how to make rice cauliflower. Although I have to say, I think every single grocery store now sells fresh um, rice cauliflower. It's usually in the area where you find the lettuce in the, in the fresh produce. All we're gonna do is we're gonna take two cups, which happens to be this bag, perfectly measured, like I said. Um, I'm all about ease. I'm all about simple recipes. I'm all about getting meals on the table um, as fast and as easy um, as possible. And I'm all about giving people confidence that they can cook because um, a lot of the problem, cooking is not hard, but I think a lot of people feel intimidated to start doing it. Um, so I'm a big believer in buying things that are already chopped, already prepped, already, you know, put in the containers just to make it that easy. So we have two cups of rice cauliflower. We have two tablespoons of pomegranate seeds, fresh pomegranate seeds. If you don't like pomegranate seeds, if you don't have them, if you can't find them, um, what I like to use are cranberries in place of that. It's really nice. I like to use something colorful in the salad. Um, especially if you're serving it to guests because the rice cauliflower, um, you know, it's white, there's not much color to it. I like to really have things that pop and add color to it. So you can use pomegranate seeds or you can use cranberries in this. Um, they're both great and I've kind of really varied it out. Um, after that, you're going to be using one fourth cup chopped fresh mint. Um, you do not want to use um, frozen mint in this or dried mint. You want fresh mint in this. Um, I just buy a thing of mint. I use what I need and then I put it in the freezer um, and it'll stay for a while. And then you're going to be using one half cup diced cucumber. Um, what I did here, it's a small baby cucumber. That's about one half cup. So if you buy a package or you have one, 
You don't even need to peel it. I actually don't like peeling the cucumbers. I just rinse them off and cut it. I'm gonna check on these because I can hear them. Yep, these are done. Here you go, I will show you. If you guys can see toasted almonds, they were very close to burning. And then the last thing is the dressing. You can use any lemon herb vinaigrette that you have. Um, it's one fourth cup dressing. What I like to do is I like to dress it and let it sit for a while. Because rice cauliflower is hard, it's nice to let the dressing absorb into it. So all you're gonna do is pour it on. Not sure if you can hear, it's the, the almonds are sizzling from the dressing. Pour it on, mix it together. Karen, somebody asked um, if you could use something besides riced cauliflower. Um, so in this recipe, really the base of it is rice cauliflower. Um, so I don't, you could use, if you want to make rice and use rice instead of this, but in terms of any other vegetable, um, you possibly could try it with broccoli. You know, they sell the broccoli cut up. Um, I really only make this recipe with rice cauliflower because it's really kind of the, the base of it. And that's what everything goes together. So I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but you know, it's there, a lot of the recipes in my cookbook, um, have substitutions that you can use. Um, this one does not because I really think that it's important to use, um, and again, fresh rice cauliflower in this. And with the lemon vinaigrette, did you have that, um, was that a brand that you used? Was that something... So, no, I'll show you the one that I use is, let's see, Tessame's Organic Lemon Garlic Dressing and Marinade Vinaigrette. I got it at Whole Foods. Um, I, I do a lot of shopping at Whole Foods. I just find it easy. I, you know, I try to use as much organic um, as possible. So um, it just, and I have a Whole Foods a couple minutes from me. Um, I do also do a lot of shopping at Trader Joe's. Any lemon vinaigrette will work in this recipe. I probably use 10 different ones. Um, this one just, I just happened to see, I've never used it before. So you can use any lemon vinaigrette you want. Uh, there's a question about the cranberries. Um, are they raw? And if, um, and when you sub them for the pomegranates and do you cut them? Um, to cut the pomegranates? The, cran the cranberries. Like so the cranberries um, are the dried cranberries. You find them in the bag, just like you would find the dried raisins. Um, yes, you do not want to use the raw cranberries. You just want to use the dried cranberries. Great. And the pomegranate seeds, I buy them in containers. Um, all of the grocery stores around me sell them. They're in small containers. Um, and then they'll stay good in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. So you can use it. I like to use it as decoration as well. A lot of my recipes that I make when I buy the when I make the salad, um, I'll then use the pomegranate seeds so they don't go to waste. If I'm making a meat dish and I'll kind of drizzle them on before I serve it, it's just, it's a pretty presentation. Yeah, prom pomegranate seeds. I love the pop of color that they give to the salad. Yeah, yeah. Where you can see it and yeah. it, it looks so pretty. Um, yeah, I know you probably can't see it, but it is, it's a beautiful salad. Yeah, well, it, I, I wanna go make it now, I'm hungry. <laughs> Um, yes. so somebody, uh, mentioned that you can find frozen pomegranate seeds in the freezer section, but would you want to use frozen ones for you this? You can actually pomegranate seeds, you can use frozen. Um, or what you can do is buy, I tend to use fresh just because I always find them. Um, and I like, I like to use, like you said, it just really adds a nice color. So I end up going through, it's just a small container. So I usually use fresh, but you absolutely, for this recipe, um, you can use frozen pomegranate seeds. So there's a question that came in, uh, for those of us who are single and thus just feeding one person, does it work for most of the recipes to get the equivalent of the already ready vegetables in frozen form? Buying fresh chopped up ingredients go bad in the fridge before I finish using them. And I'm not referring to the recipe that you're saying fresh is necessary. Yes, so 
Um, for the soup, for instance, what I would do, I actually freeze soups pretty often. So what I would do is I would actually use, but follow the recipe in the cookbook. Um, and then what I would do is just freeze it. You can freeze it in individual servings as well. That way you can just take one out and defrost it. Um, but I, I think that, you know, for instance, if you're using it, if you're, you know, if you're making, if you're making soup, it's much easier just to make a big batch of it and freeze it rather than cutting down the recipe. Do you recommend freezing it in like smaller containers so you can take one out at a time? I, yeah, I rec if you can do that, if you can put them in individual containers, you know, maybe a 12 ounce container, uh, which is a little bit more than a cup of soup. And that way you can just take it out, put it in the refrigerator in the morning. Um, and then when you get home, it should be defrosted and then you can just heat it up individually. Oh, someone is suggesting that chopped cabbage might work as a substitute for the cauliflower uh, or quinoa. Um, so quinoa, you can. I actually have a similar recipe in my cookbook with quinoa. Um, it's I for this. This is more of a vegetable salad, um, and so you know quinoa is a grain. So there actually I do have a couple recipes in the cookbook of great quinoa salads. Um, but yeah, if you want a grain instead of a vegetable, you can use it. If for a vegetable. Um, you could use cabbage. I um, you know they do sell bags of shredded cabbage. Um, I haven't tried it. I just think for me personally, um, and since I've made this so often, I would stick with the cauliflower. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I think it, it looks delicious. It is. It's a great salad. Yeah, it will be gone within a day or this entire bowl will be gone within a day or two. Yeah, it's like, and it's perfect for lunch, like, you know, especially working from home, the yeah. ease of putting it together, I think is really, um, Absolutely. you know, that that's a nice uh, advantage for sure. Yeah. And it goes great with the next recipe that we are going to make. Um, and so this recipe, we're gonna be making coconut curry mahi-mahi. Um, this was one um, that I had never made before. I mean, it turns out beautiful. Um, this is the recipe in the cookbook. This is one I had never made. I had to, um, my publisher had me um, have an entire, she wanted an entire chapter of fish recipes. And so I had to come up with a lot of new ones that were not on my blog. This was one of them. Um, my son, who's 11, so he's probably 10 at the time, maybe nine, nine and a half. Um, I made it and I just said, take one bite. Like, please just try it, take one bite because my other kids were eating it. Uh, my husband loved it and he did. And he's like, oh my God, it's good. Like this is, this is a recipe that's great for people who also don't love fish, but you wanna eat fish, um, or someone is, you're serving fish, or you have someone who's a vegetarian and you wanna make them a fish dish um, or a pescatarian. Um, this is really a great recipe and it's such a beautiful presentation. So this is a photo of it, since we probably, um, not sure we'll have time to um, show it when it's done. Um, so what we're gonna do here is, I use a large frying pan, like a large skillet for this. We are going to take two tablespoons. We're gonna turn this on to medium. We are going to use two tablespoons of melted coconut oil. In this recipe, if you do not have coconut oil, do not go out and buy it for this recipe. You can use, because we're putting an entire can of coconut milk in it, you're gonna have the coconut flavor. So if you don't have coconut oil or you don't like it, um, use avocado oil, use grapeseed oil, use, I, I don't think I would use olive oil in this one. Um, I would probably switch, I would probably use avocado or grapeseed oil, um, or if you have coconut oil, you know, that's what's in the recipe. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna heat it. And I'm just gonna take a peek at the soup. The soup is boiling. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to heat up the oil. You're going to wait for it to get a little warm. And then once it is, I have three cloves of garlic. Um, I like to use fresh garlic in this recipe. What I've also started using is the frozen garlic in the cubes. Um, I really like that. I don't, and I wouldn't recommend using pre um, the garlic that's in the can that's in the jars. There's a lot of additives in that. Um, and it doesn't really have the fresh garlic taste. So for this, you're either going to be using fresh garlic, three cloves of fresh garlic that I just put the, um, you know, just dice it not too small. Um, or you can use a couple cubes. Um, I know there's different sizes. So you just want to use the equivalent of three cloves of garlic. 
So you're gonna put this in here. You wanna get all of the wonderful garlic out. And I will say, when you're making these, the smell of these recipes, I describe it as like, someone will walk in your house and it feels like they were just like, put in a warm blanket. Like it just has this really homey smell. Um, and especially what we're making today, the soup and the, the um, coconut curry mahi mahi smells great. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cook the garlic for about two minutes. And you don't wanna overcook the garlic because it's gonna continue to cook um, when we add in the other ingredients. And after that, what we're gonna do is coconut milk. So the coconut milk we have is what is 14 ounce can. Um, most of the cans come between 13 and 14 ounces. This one I happen to just pick up at Whole Foods. There's other brands you can use. Um, I don't love the low fat coconut milk in this recipe, um, but if you are watching you know, your fat intake, you can use it. It might not be as thick, um, but it will taste great. I use just the regular full fat um, coconut milk. If you've never cooked with coconut milk before, you're going to open up the can and be like, oh my God, something is wrong with this can. It's not. Um, what happens is it separates. So you're going to have chunks of coconut and then you're going to have all this liquid. Usually it starts with the coconut on the top and then the liquid and then the coconut on the bottom. So what I like to do is open up the can. I like to put it in a bowl and just gently mix it. You don't want to get it everywhere. Just to kind of break up the chunks. If you don't want to do that, it's fine. We're cooking with it. So what's gonna happen is there's still some chunks in here. What's gonna happen is the chunks will just melt when it goes over the heat. Um, and so I'm gonna, this is a 13.5 ounce can of coconut milk. And at some point I'm gonna bring the camera over here because I want you guys to see how beautiful this looks once all of the ingredients are together. And I'm going to turn the heat down a little bit. You want it to cook. You don't want it to really boil. And then what we're putting in here are three tablespoons of red Thai curry paste. You can find this anywhere. Um, they have it at Whole Foods. They have it at my local grocery store. So what you're going to do is you're just going to add this in here. And then I have one tablespoon of brown sugar. You want to add a little bit of sweetness to this. Um, if you're not wanting to add sugar, you can omit it. It's really a small amount and it's in the sauce. So I would say the amount you're actually going to be eating is so minimal anyway, and it really does add a nice flavor. So all you're going to want to do is mix this together just for about a minute. The sauce becomes like a beautiful light red because the curry paste is red and it's being mixed with the coconut milk. Let me just, I'm gonna move it over so you guys can see this. Karen, is the mahi mahi recipe spicy due to the Thai curry paste? It is not, it is not spicy. I mean, it might have a little bit of a kick, uh, but it is not very spicy. It depends on also on your level. Um, if you want to try it out and use a little bit less, um, we eat a lot of spicy food in our house. So, you know, I think it all depends on even my 10 year old um, really likes spicy food. So I think it'll also depend, you know, kind of on, on what you're used to, but it's not very spicy, but you can also bring it down to two tablespoons to start with. I'm going to move this over for a minute just to show you guys how beautiful this looks. Um, and I'm talking while we're making it and which is making it longer. So if you're just doing this on your own, I mean, it is super fast. Can you guys see that? Yeah. And you probably can't even tell from the, you know, from the lighting in here, but it is such a nice color. And here, what I am gonna turn it down a little bit. You don't want it to boil. You just want it to cook. And then what I have here is a pound and a half of mahi-mahi. You can use other fish in this. You can use um, salmon, you can use cod, you can use halibut. Um, you don't want it to be a very flaky fish. You want it to be more of a hearty fish because you don't want it to break up in the sauce. 
Um, I went yesterday to the fish department and they cut this up for me. It's in one, one inch cube. So I just said to them, I need a pound and a half. Um, sometimes it has skin on, sometimes it doesn't. I always have them remove the skin and they cut it up for me. So all you're gonna do is put this in here. This one I'm using is the Mahi Mahi um, and they don't always, whoops, they don't always have it. Be careful. Um, what I would normally do if I'm making this um, is I, I like to put gloves on and then I would actually just take, take the fish and put it in there so it doesn't splatter like it just did. Um, it, we had a couple, uh, one question came in about uh, the coconut milk. Uh, if you have any yes. suggestions for substitutes for the coconut milk. And, and also I do want to remind everybody that we are going to be, re that we are recording this, that we will be sending this out and that we have a list of all of these tips and tricks and, and uh, suggestions that Karen has shared with us. And we will be sending that out with the recording as well. Um, um, I'll answer that in one question. What I just want, all you want to do is cover this. Um, because I'm using a large skillet, I'm just putting some tin foil over it. And then you just want to cook it on, you want to make sure it simmers, which means there's just kind of some, some very small bubbles. And then you just want to cook it for about 10 minutes. That's all it takes for the cook, the fish to be cooked through. And then what I like to do is just put in a really nice white bowl when I'm serving it, even to my family, I'll put it on the table because it's so colorful, it looks really pretty in a white bowl. Um, you can use something like this um, and then you just serve it. You can serve it over white rice. Um, it actually, this actually would go great with it on the side. It's a nice dish that would go great, you know, together, especially the colors. Um, and that's it, that's how easy it is. And can you use tilapia? Um, you know what? I don't think I would use tilapia in this. Um, I'm not a big fan of tilapia. I don't really cook with it that often as well. I just don't think it's a great fish in general to be eating. Um, so I don't really cook that much with tilapia. But tilapia is a thinner, flakier fish. So you really want to try to stay, stay with the, um, the thicker fishes. You know, if you saw, and I can show you, hold on. Let me just quickly grab a glove just so that people can kind of see what I'm talking about. If you're not familiar with Mahi Mahi, I just want to grab a piece out of here just so you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about when I say a thick fish. And it's already starting to cook. See, it's kind of, it's a hearty fish. It's not a flaky fish. Like, I guess the way I would describe it is just thinking of chicken. You know, it's something that is not going to fall apart when you're holding it. And then you can, it's, it's a little bit thicker of a fish. Amazing. Well, no, it's amazing that like three recipes we've been, you know, to, you've been cooking for what, uh, half an hour maybe. Yeah. And, um, and we've got this, all of these beautiful dishes already prepped and ready to go. We do. My family's very excited for dinner. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could help with that. <laughs> um, uh, somebody did ask what other specific fish you might recommend for that last recipe. Um, so really the ones that I mentioned are the ones that I would recommend. Um, and they have it in there. Their, it's all written. Like I said, I really wanted to try to answer any question that somebody might have in the cookbook. Um, so I didn't want anyone to look at a recipe and think, oh no, I don't have this, or what do I do? Or, you know, to really not want to cook it. There's, I've been cooking for, for I don't know, 30 years and I still don't cook recipes that have 15 ingredients. Like I just wanted to really the goal. Um, we're all busy. We all have a lot going on was just to say to people, you can do it. You can get dinner on the table. Like these are, these are that easy. Um, and a lot of the ingredients you have in your house, you know, a lot of them in the cookbook, um, you know, have honey in them or have soy sauce. They're ingredients that you already have different spices in there that you already have in your house as well. Could you make this with a chicken? You could, absolutely. Yep. Amazing. I actually think it would be great with chicken. Um, I believe somebody um, left a review on my Amazon page saying that they made it with chicken and it was turned out great. That's great. Yeah. I, yeah. And I if love you how make sure you just want to make sure whatever you're obviously whatever, you know, coconut milk is part, you just want to make sure that it's, you know, a part of coconut milk. 
Right. Well, it's it's great that you have all of these like ways to the, the recipes are so versatile is what I'm trying to say. And, and that's so, yeah. you know, it's so wonderful to be able to have six ingredients, six minutes of prep and then be able to just, you know, walk away. Um, and, yeah. Yes. Um, there, I'll tell you, there are also some nice Passover dishes in the cookbook. Um, I have a couple on my blog and then I have, um, some in my cookbook. There's a really nice recipe for lamb shanks. If you eat lamb, um, you put everything together. Um, you can use just kind of a Le Creuset, a Dutch oven, um, put everything together. It takes about three minutes to get the ingredients together. I actually happened to make it the other night and my son, my middle son, I was driving him home from basketball last night. And he's like, but it took you three minutes to get in the oven. I know it because it takes about four hours to cook. So you just want to leave it. You can also make it in a crock pot in the morning if you go to work. Um, so he's, and he actually happens to be a little, normally a little picky. Um, and he's begging for me to make this recipe again. And it's a great Passover dish if you like lamb. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. This has yes. been really wonderful. Thank you, know, you for having me. Of course, of course. And we recommend you follow Karen on social media and you check out her cookbook and her website. We also want to thank Tamara again for sharing her story with us this morning. Please take a moment to fill out the brief evaluation survey that's linked in the chat box now. Like I mentioned, we are giving away one copy of Karen's debut cookbook to someone who fills out our survey. And evaluations really do inform our future programming. So thank you so much for taking a minute to fill it out. Uh, please never forget that our social workers and genetic counselor are here for you and your loved ones. Shoshara provides emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help navigate you through the cancer experience. All are free, completely private, one-on-one. -on -one. Our number is 866-474-2774. And you can also email us at clinicalstaff at shoshara.org. Finally, I want to share our next national webinar with you. Join us as we come together for Sharsheret's fourth annual pre-Passover experience. At this year's Unseder, we'll focus on the leaning we do at the Seder as we eat matzah and drink wine and the leaning in we can do to help smooth our cancer experiences. Please join us for Passover insights, music, and meditation. The link to that is in the chat. Um, you can also access the recordings and transcripts of all of our past webinars on our website. Um, from all of us at Sharshara, thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next time.